For those unfamiliar with trial coverage, a trial can last um, anywhere from three weeks to several years and you know one doesn't sort of cut to the chase when it comes to trial coverage. It is all about meticulously following each um, narrative and, and sometimes a court day will be one long narrative, sometimes it spans, you know, especially if it's testament in chief, can span several days um, uh, for example with Jody Arias I think she was on the stand for 18 days I mean it was unprecedented um, in other cases you will have many shortish narratives and ultimately um, that builds up to a hopefully in terms of a particular counsel a cogent narrative so um, in this case, um, what the prosecution is trying to do is put together a um, timeline and um, parts of the puzzle for that timeline are surveillance footage, um, witness statements, um, police body cam footage, recordings, um, um, data from surveillance cameras, uh, cell phone data and and so on and so what's really happening is that the, the prosecution have a turn quite a long turn to present their case and essentially what they are up against here is they are trying to put together a compelling timeline to say based on all the evidence this looks like what Patrick Frazy was doing. You know, it looks like this is what he was. Um, th this is the sequence of events, right? When they're done, then the defence will have their bite at the cherry, and what they will then do is the defence will try to um, undermine the prosecution's case. And of course, nobody knows better than um, Patrick Frazy what he was doing, right? So he may necessarily know little details that no one else would. In any event, um, they're going to try and provide a different timeline which kind of exonerates him, um, which provides sort of innocent explanations for why he was doing what he was doing. But you, you're you not going to get um, a sort of a cut to the chase thing of uh, what is the point from the prosecution? Uh, what is the point of the defense? And then, and then make your decision that way. You need to meticulously go through all the evidence and then the jury needs to examine it and me as a narrator um, the difficulty for me is knowing what you know and and then also um, providing you with interesting insights but also not um, spoiling the narrative that I am preparing you know um, I don't want the YouTube videos that I'm making to be a substitute or a replacement for the narrative that I'm writing so there's a lot of stuff I want to share with you, but I'm um, I'm sort of teasing it and I'm sort of mentioning it um, in in brief. Um, I got a complaint today where someone said um, they were very let down by um, yesterday's video. Um, that may be my fault, but it also may be that you weren't paying attention to the video if you actually paused it on cert certain of the images and read the content that was there you might have seen what what was being discussed I will touch on that um, a little bit here um, but you know it's really not my job in these YouTube videos to sort of take you to um, or it's my job to take you to the water but it's not my job to make you drink um, you know I'm not being paid for these YouTube videos and you've got no you know, if you, you get bored, you can leave. So there's no, you know, it's basically if you find the content interesting, then stick around. If not, leave, you know. Um, but but I'm going to be providing some insights, but I'm certainly not going to be 
um, giving you, laying all my, my cards on the table in terms of what I think about this crime. There are certain things that I can discuss, but there are certain things that, that are hard-won research that, that's obviously going to be um, um, put into the narrative. And I've already started compiling it. There's a framework. And um, a little bit of what I'm mentioning is, uh, touches on what's in the narrative, but I certainly don't want to duplicate or re replicate what's there. But I'm going to defer to this person who was so critical, and in the first 10 minutes I'm going to give you the punchline of this particular video and, and you can see whether it works. So, so I'm going to, within the first 10 minutes, we had 5 minutes, now I'm going to give you the punchline for day 3 of the, the trial. And if you feel happy with it and satisfied with it, then you don't need to sit through the next 20 minutes or whatever, that you can sort of carry on with whatever you want to do. So we dealing with trial day three. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it deals with the timeline, um, and this court day actually wrapped up fairly quickly. It seems like the prosecution sort of were so moving so quickly they sort of ran out of witnesses. Um, something that I think I'm going to do um, from now on is sort of select the tweet of the day. Um, and maybe you guys can help me with it, um, especially if you're on Twitter. Um, follow me at, at Crime Rocket. Um, and then, you know, if you, you feel like you've come across the tweet of the day, let me know. Um, I think the tweet of the day is a toss up between Elise Schmelzer's um, uh, tweet um, where she talks about somebody in court had the slip of the tongue and, and called Patrick Frazee Patrick Swayze in front of everyone. Um, it is an unusual name. I, I don't think I've ever seen that surname anywhere. Um, so, you know, it is an unusual name. Um, another tweet that, that caught my eye was from Sam Kramer and he talks about um, when Sean Frazee left the courtroom on his way out um, Kramer said that he saw Sean give Patrick a strong look, then turn his head and roll his eyes. Um, it's this kind of attention to detail um, that's, that's um, very important in true crime. Um, you know, I've sat in, in, in um, trials and there's nothing better than just watching the um, defendant like a hawk and, and noticing the little interactions that is trying to either um, uh, hide from the media or um, minimize or whatever it is or conceal um, and so it, it is interesting these little interactions that you see um, I'm under the assumption that um, Sean Frazee is a prosecution witness um, I'm not in court, but it does seem sort of reasonable to assume that the first sort of swathe of um, of witnesses and people testifying are those called by the prosecution. And you know, people called by the prosecution um, sometimes they testify voluntarily, and sometimes they are sort of subpoenaed. Um, but one wonders whether Sean. Um, um, supports his brother um, you know he is a policeman and um, that is something that I brought up in the blog post you know he, where he says he didn't know what to think you know could he really not know what he think you know when all of this is happening his job as a policeman is to know what to think to make a call but this whole thing of him giving Patrick a strong look turning his head and rolling his eyes is almost as if to say um, I don't know what's up with you dude um, you know um, you did to me or I can't believe you did this or you know um, it's almost like giving him a um, a gesture that is like giving him the birdie kind of thing okay and then as promised um, I said that within the first 10 minutes I would give away the punchline of this case well I'm gonna show you my notes 
and you can then just see what I'm going to be talking about and then that's basically it you can just look at my notes and if I take you through them it's um, this and that and thought paralysis and then there's also something about if you look at that yellow highlighted piece there um, something about Khashoggi and October 16th and wow well that's the punchline there you have it I mean th that's the punchline so if you if you're happy then that's the punchline of the of, of, of this um, of this coverage do you have it in the first 10 minutes For the rest, you've got a little bit more time and patience and have longer attention spans. Um, we're going to go through um, several layers of trial day three. First of all, I'm going to track back very briefly to core day two and just touch on something that I glossed over very quickly just to show you that I am providing you guys with, with insights, but you know, it depends on you whether you're going to be thinking about them or not. Um, so we're going to sort of hover over this concept of intertextuality just um, for a while um, in terms of yesterday and then we're going to deal with the same thing um, but in a bit more detail today in terms of uh, in an intertextual element that I want to sort of deal with um, and it has to do with kind of a, a question which is how did that black tote get into um, Patrick Frazee's truck how did it get there uh, um, and that's kind of a mystery of this case um, the defense have said that it he may have loaded it up when he was buying dog food at Walmart um, but it's certainly not caught on the camera so that is a mystery and um, it's through a little bit of intertextuality that we may um, come some way towards answering this question once glossing through the intertextuality aspect then I want to run through just a couple of tweets just highlighting the uh, basic um, court narrative especially in the afternoon and then from there um, we're going to go back into the uh, intertextual aspect especially dealing with um, Khashoggi and the um, how to commit the perfect murder and how this may have influenced um, Patrick Frazee. Um, but before we get to that, um, please subscribe, um, please like, share, leave a comment. Um, if you have any criticisms, you're welcome to share them, but, but try and do them in a respectful way. Um, you know, I'm here trying to be of service to you, and if you don't like what you're getting, well, be friendly about it there's no need to be rude and if you've got any suggestions make suggestions but um, you know um, I'm happy to um, be of service but I'm certainly not um, here to tick every single box and keep every single person happy what I'm what I'm trying to do is is sort of um, provide you guys with a cogent summary of each day's um, uh, trial testimony and then also something extra and it is a little bit difficult to um, not repeat what you already know it's difficult to know whether some of you are reading a lot and you want something extra or whether you're reading nothing whether you're relying on me for everything and so that's the sort of tightrope I've got to walk um, okay so um, going back to yesterday um, I touched on a intertextuality in terms of December 5th and what I was trying to get at is um, you have Patrick Frazee contacting um, you know coming out of his cave you must remember if he has committed a murder he's now stepping out and he's taking a risk by making these moves and encountering these people because they can potentially be witnesses against him and, and they have been so these steps he took were you know basically he was getting very antsy and getting very nervous 
and what you notice is on the same day that the these that he contacted for example um, Patricia Key from the bank that is on December 5th on the same day you get press coverage of the um, Chris Watts case and it's and it's sh you know you you're actually seeing body cam footage and there's um, additional coverage of what um, what the police knew about him you know what they saw from his phone records for example that he'd called the primrose school and and then how he was um, interrogated by agent Coda from the FBI and now Coda was telling him no 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 you called at this time and this is what you spoke about and and so Chris Watts didn't really have that much room to move and so you can imagine if um, Frazee read the Mercury News for example he would have been pretty shocked at how much the how much law enforcement could find out about him based on um, sort of ordinary um, CCTV footage and so on and he was getting a lot of this insight f through the Chris Watts case um, if you don't know the Chris Watts case very well if you didn't go and look at those articles that were that were shown on um, December 5th if you w didn't try and into it you, you know put yourself in his shoes and imagine you're him and you reading that article and what that is saying to you you know, it's, it's literally hitting the panic switch and saying, Jeepers, what do they know about me? What, based on this, what should they know about me? And and it looks like it act activates him to the extent that he goes and speaks to these um, employees. One on December 5th, the, the bank employee, and another on December 11th. And on that day, of course, there's another article also about um, surveillance footage and so on. And so in my analysis of the Chris Watts case, um, a lot of people were saying that Chris Watts is a dumb criminal and so on. And then I used the analogy of the Khashoggi uh, case, and that's a nightmare to pronounce correctly. I'm not even going to go into that. But um, in, in any way, um, I used that case to present a, an argument for how difficult it is to commit a perfect murder. In that case, you had um, sort of um, intelligence officials, a whole team of them, like 15 people, working in concert to commit the perfect murder. I mean, they, they literally had forensic experts on, you know, at on, on hand. It was a premeditated crime, and um, they didn't get away with it. They 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 were found out, um, but. Nevertheless, that crime, which took place in early October 2018, um, provided a scenario for how to get rid of a body from one location to another, made world headlines, and there was later um, CCTV footage and screen grabs showing what people saw and then also what they didn't know. And so bear in mind that this happened in October and Kelsey Barrett disappeared um, basically one month later in on November 22nd. So could Patrick Frazee have seen this um, coverage of Khashoggi's disappearance? Of course he could have. Um, very likely he did in the same way that he probably heard of Chris Watts and even Casey Anthony as well. Um, you may think it's not a big deal but it's a very big deal where you have a situation of someone committing a crime and they're getting the intelligence by other crimes. It's very important because when, when you know that that's the mechanism, it's also easier and quicker to defeat their shenanigans. It's easier to neutralize their intelligence because you, you, you're catching on to their scheme and you're seeing where they're getting their ideas from, right? Now we'll come back to Khashoggi and deal with him in a bit more detail in terms of how that, that crime was executed. Um, but first let's drill down into some of the daily, um, the, the tweets that were sent through, through the day and um, 
and just sort of general just just touch on some of the general information so the first one is from Sam Kramer again and he talks about um, he quotes the, the the sort of moment that um, the investigators realized that um, there appeared to be foul play and that Frazee uh, needed to be a suspect and it was basically when they found out that he'd called um, Idaho and Bereth's phone and then also last pinged in Idaho so um, just that gave them kind of an indication that um, maybe he knew more than he was letting on one should also bear in mind that Kelsey's mother uh, um, lives in Idaho and so transporting her phone there sort of creates the impression that maybe she went to see her mother from Ashley Franker there are a pair of tweets dealing with um, financial issues uh, we see that in from as long as October 2017 to July 2018 um, Frazee was paying about $700 in child support um, it's noted that the child support money was not court ordered um, Ashley Franker goes on to say that Frazee even hired a lawyer to help with setting up custody papers and um, although they were never filed they existed um, they, and then there were rumors of this and, and, and this was later confirmed now what this seems to suggest is a situation where you have a sort of burgeoning um, crisis or a you know a, a sort of wave is building up and the wave is that the, there's possibly a custody battle um, that is going to happen uh, especially if he is going to break up with Kelsey in in a situation where he doesn't murder her and um, and then there's and then that would involve you know expensive court battles and you know if you're struggling financially he would probably want to avoid that and so you have the same potentially the same scenario with the Chris Watts case where instead of saying you know why didn't you just get a divorce one could would one could ask why didn't you just go through a custody um, hearing and that's an important question to pose and then hold there and then to consider there may be several reasons for it um, but one of them may well be financial hardship financial difficulties um, and financial um, vulnerability from there we go to Lance Benzel from the Gazette I think and he refers to the defense lawyer Steigerwald I think saying that um, Frazee can be seen in the parking lot surveillance loading items into his pickup um, but that another vehicle is blocking some of his movements um, again it's difficult to know what to make of all of this without seeing it oneself um, you know there's often a lot of nuance in footage and since we can't see the actual um, surveillance footage it's difficult to see what would be obscured and, and whether whether there would be an opportunity but um, according to the defense um, the black tote um, changed positions in Frazee's pickup and um, Steigerwald said that you know Frazee stopped at Walmart and they purchased um, big items large items including dog food and then per perhaps he bought I guess the black tote then or, or maybe it changed positions because of these you know by putting large items into the into the pickup that was their explanation okay and then if we look at some of the last tweets um, there's one from another one from Lance Benzel and he refers to CBI agent Greg Slater um, and his review of evidence pointing to possible motive and so um, this 
is specifically a reference to um, the finances and we see um, a letter showing Frazy defaulting on a $72,000 uh, loan. That's a big deal. Um, th that's a very big deal. Um, you know, if, if Chris Watts was defaulting on a mortgage, uh, it meant he had no money. And if Patrick um, Frazy was defaulting on a very big loan, it basically meant, did he have any money? Did he, was he able to make ends meet? Um, we also see that although he'd been paying Kelsey $700 a month, his last payment was in June 2019, so he'd missed a payment in July, he'd missed a payment in August, he'd missed a payment in September, he'd missed a payment in October, and you know, that's four months. And so um, the financial aspect seems to be a very, very strong argument in this case. Again, if you're not that person with no money, it's easy to dismiss someone else's moneylessness. But if you are that person, then it can lead to de desperation, uh, frustration leading to um, anger and anguish and despair. Elish Schmelzer also highlighted this financial aspect. Um, she also spoke about the $72,000 loan and the child support and she then also brought in this whole aspect of his brother highlighting the family actually clashing over um, his dad's 400000 estate. So we can see you had sort of two things happening at the same time. You had moneylessness and then you also had um, the sort of treasure, you know, um, hanging in the balance in terms of his father's estate. In the Chris Watts case you kind of had the same thing. You kind of had um, no money and, and debt and you know um, financial malaise and then you had this big house that, that you know if Watts could get control over he, he could sell and he could instantly get himself out of debt. Um, and so you, you kind of have a similar scenario in terms of incredible um, financial um, trouble but then also a sort of a glittering um, trophy um, sort of taunting and, and sort of um, be, uh, like a kind of a temptation um, waiting on the other side of the rainbow kind of thing. And then the final tweet I'm gonna highlight here is another one from Lance Benzel and it's just touching on a handwritten document found at Frazee's ranch where he'd written down a timeline of events um, surrounding Kelsey's disappearance and according to this timeline he said he met her at 12.30 p.m. to exchange the child um, and I think what that means is he would then t pick up his child um, I think that's what it meant that 12.30 doesn't seem like the right time. Um, I think it's an hour before he actually did pick her up. Um, and now we're going to touch on intertextuality in a little bit more detail. Um, if you look at that image of um, the Matrix and Alice books, um, if you just look at that image you see a picture of Alice and the tree and the Cheshire cat and then in the sort of background you see sort of a tapestry of um, matrix code streaming down. Now I can actually see and hear people groaning you know like stop going off on a tangent. Um, this isn't a tangent this is dealing with um, true crime intertextuality and what we're dealing with here is in the same way you see that with Alice in Wonderland and the matrix the whole idea of tumbling down the rabbit hole or following the white rabbit. Um, in true crime, in, in, in this particular case, we're going to see that there's potential intertextuality with several other cases, and now specifically we're going to look at the Khashoggi case. Now, a little bit of um, very basic um, relationship between um, Frey and um, 
this other information out there. And I realize this is somewhat tenuous, but just follow where I'm coming from. If we think of just about the idea of intertextuality, it's the relations between meanings. It's, it's finding um, matching meanings um, in different scenarios. And so if you've got somebody who wants to commit a crime, in other words, it's premeditated, and he's being exposed to something that he's he's maybe sitting watching the news or just sitting in his lounge and this comes across his radar. It's a meaning that is going to resonate with him and he's going to pay attention to it. He's going to notice it. Um, and there, there are so, there's so much media and information crossing our horizons daily. Um, it's, it's, it's not just ordinary people who, who come up, you know, who, who deal with a lot of information it's also um, murderers it's also criminals they are also um, they get their ideas from what they see around them what they hear and so and so if we refer to the Denver Post um, we see that when um, Frazy approaches the store employee um, Phyllis uh, I think that was that was on the 11th, what he said was, what he said to this employee was, don't believe everything they're saying about me. And what does that tell you? It tells you that Frazy knows what is being said about him. And what does that mean? The fact that he knows what's being said about him means he's actively watching the news. He's actively reading um, the, uh, about himself. He's, he's studying coverage. And if he was stu studying coverage after the fact, then he was certainly um, the kind of person who would do it before the fact. He was also um, studying things ahead of time. And we know in this particular case, if um, Crystal Kenny is believable, credible, then um, the several versions of, you know, the several um, solicitations to co commit murder are showing that um, there's this possibility that he was definitely thinking about what he wanted to do a great deal. He was certainly plotting and thinking and triggered a great deal. And so this brings us to the Khashoggi case and um, what's amazing with this case is you also have in a way similar um, um, fairly rudimentary footage of a crime. There's very little information and yet it's enough to piece together a very basic idea. Um, there, there's certain time stamps that give us an idea of when the crime may have been complete. You see a vehicle backing up to the near to the door. That's also something we don't know. We don't know how close um, Frazee's vehicle got to any of the entrances or exits of her home so you know without that information it's difficult to be um, to be very clear um, but in the coverage of Khashoggi we see quite a lot of detail we see him enter we see um, maps of the con compound and j even in just the basic coverage of this th there's a there's a mental mirror for what the what trial day to um, especially with Chad Meningen, you know wh what that covered. It's the same kind of thing. It's it's um, CCTV stills. It's home layouts. It's how did you know they get this person's body out? Um, you see the person go in, but you don't see them come out. How did it happen? It's mysterious, but it's it's a similar mysteriousness. Do you see that? And in both cases, um, the remains. Um, are transported to a different location and then disposed of at this different location. Now, um, in the blog post that I wrote at the time, dated October 16, so bear in mind this is a full um, month and almost a week, so almost five weeks before Kelsey's disappearance. Bear also in mind that Khashoggi's murder took place two weeks earlier than that, so at the beginning of October. And so some of the um, 
aspects that I, I mentioned in terms of a perfect murder, but specifically in terms of the Khashoggi case, um, you know, what are the ingredients of it? Um, number one, it's premeditated. Number two, it involves murder behind closed doors at a prescribed time and place with a prescribed victim and perpetrator. Number three, the crime scene needs to be a secure location where the murder can be ex executed without being seen, without being heard, without interference and without unfriendly witnesses. In other words, the, issues, the issue isn't necessarily that there aren't witnesses, but more pertinently that if they, if they are, they won't talk. Um, number four, it involves a getaway vehicle and a plan to remove the body from the crime scene to a defined burial location, which is also secure. And in the Frazy case, um, the um, alleged burial location is literally, um, allegedly, his own property. So, so it would be far more remote and even more secure. Number five, the vehicle is backed up to the entrance to allow for ease of transfer of the body and also to minimize DNA transfer to the ground. Number six, the perpetrators have a ready explanation for the crime. They don't know where the victim went. He disappeared. It has nothing to do with them. Number seven, there are no traces of the victim at the crime scene. Now, one thing that appears to be an error in the Denver Post is where the coverage refers to a series of photos showing Frizzy back at the condo at around 4 p.m. Now, I'm assuming that's an error because showing, referring to him back at the condo uh, almost implies that, that the truck pulls up again. Um, and um, that may be, I mean, maybe the, the person sitting in court observed that. So it would be good to have clarity. But the way I understand it, he never left. So in other words, there's a grouping of photos between 11 and 1.30 p.m., right? And then there's another set of photos at 4 p.m., in other words, two and a half hours later. And so I don't believe that he... he He's back at the condo. I believe that he f he simply emerged from the condo two and a half hours later. And then the question is, what was he doing inside for two and a half hours? If this is correct, what was he doing um, in the condo? And um, how is this for an kind of an amazing intertextuality in terms of the Frazee case and the Watts case? It's um, the contention of of true crime rocket science across the two-phase series that Chris Watts killed his wife at um, around about 1.48 immediately after she arrived home and and then you know by about 5.20 he carried um, the victims out in, you know, into the driveway that is exactly two and a half hours um, so we, we sort of almost have a matching ballpark for how long it takes to to commit a murder potentially um, process the crime scene and when I, I say that I mean remove clothes um, the person who's committed the crime also needs to wash change their clothes um, and then also um, um, clean the victim and wrap the victim and clean up the crime scene and how long does that take bear in mind you know you can't just leave a let's say there's a a, a, a blood red stain on a carpet you've got to make sure that that stain is completely gone when you leave and so or even if it's feces you, you and, and so how long does it take to clean something up like that it can take quite a long time um, if you're doing a load of washing, um, it might take um, an hour plus half an hour to dry. And so, just in terms of the timeline, that's certainly an interesting calculation. Something that was very strange for me was um, Sean Frazee was not asked by prosecutors or even his brother's public defenders about what they, what about how he thought his brother acted when 
when he saw him um, at their mother's florescent home. Um, there was no volunteering from him of how he thought his brother acted. It was just not mentioned. And that's quite bizarre. It's quite bizarre that you, you wouldn't um, try to find out, you know, how did this person act. And um, it's, a, it's a weird situation because you have the brother testifying and one could argue um, bias one way or the other. One could say, um, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 f a funny example. Um, in the Henry F v Van Breda case in South Africa, which is a triple X murder, his sister survived the, the axe attack, so there were three victims, his parents and his older brother, and then his sister, he also attacked with an axe, but she survived. She wasn't called to testify, and in, in a situation like that, she stood to inherit, um, I think, 200 million rand, and um, if she testified and um, the case was found in his favor, she could potentially have lost out by um, lost out in terms of inheriting money um, because she could have one could accuse her of having an agenda you know that she was trying to favor herself and so in the end sh she didn't testify at all and she ultimately did inherit the, the full amount um, and so one can see how the not testifying um, there is a sort of a legal um, common sense involved even though it doesn't make complete sense in other respects I don't, I don't know if that makes sense okay and so just to touch on a couple of other aspects I mentioned earlier that Sean Frazee didn't know said he didn't know what to think when Kelsey disappeared um, I find that very odd um, The last known image of Kelsey was taken at uh, 1.23 p.m. And this suggests that um, something happened between 1.23 p.m. and 4 p.m. 4 p.m. is when un the last series of photos showing Fuzzy um, at the condo. Again, the mystery that seems to be persisting in this case is um, in the footage from the ATM um, that he visited just after noon on Thanksgiving Day, you can see a large black box in the back of his red truck. And um, interestingly, in the Scott Peterson case, there is a large green container in the back of his truck. Um, but the mystery is how did... Um, he get Kelsey's body into that container and did he and finally and, and this is from the Denver Post article it, it ref just refers to prosecutors alleging in the opening statements that um, Frizee burned his fiance's body uh, at his ranch with the help of another woman and just those words are incredibly unnerving and unsettling you know this idea of um, a man burning his fiance's body and and then another woman helping him um, another woman um, helping him it, it is it's barely comprehensible and in this respect I think the Frazee case is kind of a match for the the horrors of the Watts case even though the body count in the Watts case is so much greater, the the um, mercenary nature that you see in the Frazee case, the the inhumanity, you know, man's inhumanity to a woman is ghastly. It's 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 beggar's belief. And um, I'm going to finish up by asking a question, and and it's a question that the narrative. Uh, murder most foul will address and needs to address and, and it's it's basically asking the question what kind of person is this guy um, if he committed the crime um, how did he do it 
you know, he said that he put something over her head and made her smell candles, but how did it actually play out? What is the actual um, uh, mechanism? And how does that match his personality and his identity? And that's the hard work that that, that needs to be covered in um, Murder Most Fall. And, and it takes time. It takes time to get to know someone, get to know the... Um, the triggers, their tempers, their t- trials and tribulations playing out in the background and, and so on. In any event, that's it for um, trial day three. Um, I'll see you tomorrow for trial day four. Thank you for listening. Listening. Listening.